So 11 years, a lot's happened probably in 11 years. You think? <laughs> so you were co-founder, CEO, DreamWorks Anima Animation back then. Um, you, you left DreamWorks to start WonderCo. Um, tell for the people here who don't know what WonderCo is, tell a little about WonderCo. Yeah, I'm, and maybe I'll do this, uh, actually um, go back a step here to sort of, because then it'll answer that, I, I think, in a way that's um, a little bit more relatable. So in the 40 years that I spent in uh, media and entertainment, um, what may not be uh, quite so obvious, although that certainly does shine a bit of a light on it, is, is that technology has been essential um, for pretty much every sort of big chapter along the way for me. Uh, some of the more obvious ones are when we went from hand-drawn animation to um, more complex uh, computer animation. Um, it, it's incredible how uh, uh, intertwined my businesses became with Northern California, with the tech industry, uh, with tech entrepreneurs, and they were really essential ingredients to um, pretty much every facet, as I say, al along the way. And I, I actually, uh, the original Shrek movie was made at our campus uh, on Redwood Shores uh, in Palo Alto. We had 800 artists and engineers there. Um, and so I think my exposure to that world uh, has sort of been over a quite a long period of time. And when I was 23 years old and I um, was looking for a, like a career path, I, I was in New York and I'd been in politics and government and uh, I asked myself, uh, I wanted uh, fortune and fame. <laughs> and in 1974, if you wanted fortune and fame, there's only one place to go, is Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, and uh, got lucky enough to go and got some of each. Um, but uh, when I sold DreamWorks, uh, now about six years or so ago, um, I, I had had such a, uh, a, a great uh, experience of being involved with over 400 movies and over 40 animated and over 85 TV shows and five Broadway plays. I just wanted something really different, new. I wanted to really just sort of start fresh and ask myself, if you were 23 years old today and you wanted to go find fortune and fame, you would go to Silicon Valley. Right. The world of technology and the way I thought about it uh, then is, is that if you look back 10 years and you look at the impact that uh, digital technology has had in virtually every facet of our lives, not all for good, but mostly, right, in terms of all of the things that has made better, faster engagement, social uh, uh, commerce, it's, it's everywhere in everything we're doing. And you look at the next 10 years, my feeling is it'll be 10x the impact. Like, we're just getting started. The rate of innovation, the rate of, um, uh, of, of how we deploy digital technology in our, in our world is only going to be greater. And so for me, I want to be part of that. And that's what sent me there. So when you look across now verticals and industries, so right, Hollywood and, and media still, you're looking at technologies there, but WonderCo is looking broader. You have investments across other sectors. Um, what is the key ethos around WonderCo? Is it just purely technology? Is it looking at, again, digital transformation of all industries? How do you think about the investments? No, we've gotten pretty focused, um, really, I would say, into primarily two lanes. Um, and, and one has been uh, software as a service, and in particular, how that uh, can be used and deployed uh, uh, by the consumer, the end user of that. So it may be for enterprise or for SMB, but it is, uh, uh, you know, the application of SaaS. Um, and, uh, and, and most of our investments have been along those lines. The other half of what we have done, and has been actually the more interesting and exciting for me, is that we've been in the buy and build and incubating, and almost all of that 
I know this won't come as a surprise to anybody in this room, it's actually been about cybersecurity. So like, what do I know about cyber? <laughs> well, I have very smart partners um, and uh, uh, have learned a lot, still have a lot to learn, but to me, I, I have uh, found that as a place of great need and only going to grow uh, exponentially in the coming years. And it's a place where I feel like uh, I can do good while doing good. Um, because the, the way I think about it today is, is that uh, we have all, we made a trade-off in which, you know, we, we sort of said that, you know, we would um, accept all the great things that can happen for us on this device. Um, and we would give up our privacy and we were all pretty okay with that. And, we get targeted for ads and, you know, that was the price of admissions for all of these amazing, amazing things that actually we loved in our, that, that came along with us. What we didn't realize and is now becoming very apparent is we actually have traded away our safety uh, and our security. And not only ours, but our children, um, uh, our, our, our loved ones and our parents. We've all become vulnerable. And a couple of just quick stats here, which is um, two years ago, burglary, theft from burglary was about $3.8 billion in the US. And digital theft was about 3.6 billion. By the end of this year, um, burglary has actually gone up to about 4 point, estimated it'll be about 4.2 billion, and digital theft is actually going to surpass 7 billion, wow. and going like this. And so um, we all uh, have, um, if, you, if, you ha if you are on a, uh, your digital footprint uh, is gonna become more and more vulnerable, and uh, if we don't protect it, it's kind of like getting in one of these beautiful new cars out there and not putting a seatbelt on. It just makes no sense. And yet, uh, there hasn't been a lot of investment and innovation in consumer cybersecurity, and that's where we have sort of um, kind of dug in deep and are. So you have an investment in, in a company called Aura. Yeah. Uh, Hari was supposed to join us, I think, had uh, to, to stay on the East Coast. And Aura really looks at your digital footprint across all your devices, right? So from mobile to your desktop to your identity online and really provides, I mean, you know, I know many people who have gone through identity theft online. It's a very difficult process. Aura helps people even in a white glove sort of way to be able to navigate everything from the credit bureaus uh, all the way through their identity online. Yeah, so it literally is, you know, um, and when we looked at the, pro at the problem, and the solutions, it's not that there are no solutions, actually there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a digital idiot. Um, how am I to know which ones? Do I need antivirus? You know, do I need, you know, credit card masking? Do I, like, I, I don't, I mean, it's just there's, and if you did know which ones to, to choose, it costs you about $200 a month to, put them all together and every single one, you'd end up with 10 different services, you'd actually have you know 10 different accounts, and it's just impractical. And so uh, what we've done is we bought seven companies, uh, did a roll up of them, integrated them together, spent now two years building all kinds of features and functions. And so one place, one time for $15, $18 a month, you actually oh. can get a very comprehensive um, uh, uh, family plan, because it's very much focused at uh, family, you know, having parental controls and the, the, the sort of good versions of knowing where uh, uh, people are and what they're doing, your kids in particular. And believe it or not, our parents are in fact the most vulnerable. Most of the digital theft is phishing that's going on against people that are 60 years and older. Right. Um, so Wonderco, uh, invested in Quibi. I know that's one company we were talking about. Um, just t for those who, who, you know, timing coming into the pandemic, you know, just talk a little about, I mean, taking your entertainment experience, you know, launching a new platform, um, the learnings from that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Quibi was a, uh, I thought I had, I, I had dropped the mic on media and entertainment and then just made the mistake of one more shot. Um, and it was a moonshot. It was a giant idea, um, one that was both uh, driven by a creative uh, ambition and goal, which was to create super high quality um, uh, content in uh, bite size. If you you know think about chapters of you know super high quality stuff that you could watch on your phone on the go, it was literally designed for that single purpose. Um, and uh, you know the the content that was created. I don't know how many people in this room ever got to watch any of it, but it was actually that part actually nailed it. They, they, the creative community in Hollywood did an exceptional job and made some fantastic content. Unfortunately, we never had product market fit. And um, uh, because of the structure of it and the amount of content that we were turning out on a, on a very rapid calendar, it's one, it was literally a, an everything or nothing. And uh, you know, for me, I, I found the failure of Quibi to be humbling. I didn't find it to be humiliating um, because I felt like we actually took a great shot at something. Um, and I've grown up uh, uh, in a world in which there's a very clear equation um, that I'd share with you, which has been true of every single content that I've ever been involved with, every business I've ever been involved with, which is, and actually Barry Diller was the person who taught me this. He was probably my first and maybe my most influential mentor in my career. He's the one that hired me when I was 23. Um, if you do things that are unique and original, they actually equal risky. And if you do things that are risky, they actually equal, at least sometimes, failure. And so if you do not have built into the equation, if failure, failure cannot be fatal. Because if failure is fatal, you won't take risks. And if you don't take risks, you actually won't do things that are unique and original. And one of the many qualities that I think is unique and I quite like about Silicon Valley culturally is that it it understands there is failure in what you do. And failure is not a, you know, a, a, a black mark. It's not an A. It's not, um, it's not humiliating. Um, in Hollywood, it is and always has been. And what I can tell you, you know, for those who have ne never been on the receiving end of it, which is when you make something and you put yourself out there and it's not any good, and I have a very, very, very long list of things that were not that good. It's brutal. You know, you get, you get beat up, you know, you, you get taken to, and, and by the way, whatever the be beating is I take for movie stars, it's really rough, right? And we've all seen the careers of ups and downs. Um, I was watching last night, I guess there's a new series coming on with Sly Stallone. I've known Sly for his entire career, and I've watched him go through this amazing, right. amazing ups and downs, and the emotional you know, wear and tear that that puts on you is, is really extraordinary. Silicon Valley actually handled at least that in a better way. The last thing I will say is, is that um, uh, you know, Quibi was, uh, you know, again, because of the size and the scale of it, uh, financially was just a gigantic, gigantic undertaking. And I, it's the first time ever for me that I lost money for people who were backing me. And that I actually did find humiliating. Like I had a really, really hard time uh, accepting, you know, to people who put up money, who believed in the idea, believed in me, and I disappointed them by losing the money. And so the one thing I ended up feeling, you know, working super hard is the moment it was clear to me Quibi wasn't going to work, and that was around 90 days out, maybe 60, 90 days out, I did everything I could to shut the thing down as fast as I could and ended up returning $600 million to our investors, which I think is kind of, its failure is unprecedented, but also the return of 600 million is equally unprecedented. But well, when we were talking backstage, you know, there are entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. You know, obviously, you look at the last two weeks, people like Sam Bankman-Fried, Adam Newman, 
um, that have had these catastrophic failures in the public eye, but that are getting refunded, you know, by Silicon Valley VCs. How do you see that? How do you sort of look at, you know? Well, I, I, one, I don't, you know, I don't want to characterize, like I've never met Adam, I don't n know, you know, I, I, I watch the TV show, so, and I'm told that Jared Leto nailed him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know Jared Leto, but I don't know Adam Newman. <laughs> um, but I, I would say, you know, one of the things for me in my career, because, you know, I was a buyer for 40 years, and I have been pitched by you name it, everybody under the sun, you know, with a big idea, gonna change the world, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, you learn the signals. There are signals that you, that at least for me, and I think other people that have done the job that I've done, in which you get to see what are the attributes that are real and authentic to somebody who has that passion, has that vision, has that dream, has that ambition, you know, is literally sees something that others maybe cannot. And over a very long period of time, I, I felt like I got pretty good at reading the signals. And I always used to say, you know, it's, don't bullshit a bullshitter. And Sam Bankman Fried is a freaking fraud. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've, I mean, this is, He's a hustler, he's a salesman, and you know, I, I, he's a promoter, and I, I just, um, you know, people who I hold in really high regard, you know, right. ended up buying into it, and, and you know, I'm surprised. Yeah, um, and we only have a couple more minutes. I wanted to talk about, we, we were talking at dinner about the midterms, and uh, people came out, and we, we said, was there a single issue, and I think you said, People came out in support of democracy. Um, you know, talk a little about that. It was such an important time. You know, we didn't know what, sitting here what the outcome would have been. Um, you're a big supporter. You, you know, talk a little about where you think the world is today. How we move forward. So I, you know, I have been involved again. It's my earliest part of my career was in politics and government. And I've always maintained being super active in it. I believe I am lucky to live in a country um, that, that has a rule of law, that has uh, the freedoms that are afforded us, that have the capitalism that, you know, has benefited so, so many of us, that um, uh, the enterprise of democracy is something I, I appreciate deeply and I care about deeply. And um, I have found what has gone on in these last few years, the sort of tribalism, so disconcerting to me and, and fearful for me. I will uh, surprise, I'm, I, I think I have been over the decades among the largest, most consistent uh, supporters and fundraisers, run, fundraisers on behalf of uh, uh, the Democrats, certainly the presidentials in it. But I will tell you, I don't believe anybody gave more money to support Liz Cheney than I did. And I don't agree with her about anything other than her literally being, to me, an American hero. She's a patriot. And what she did to defend what we all take maybe for granted or shouldn't, I, I hold her in the highest regard for that. And, and so I, I actually think that of all the things that have been, that I think the American public is dealing with, whether it's inflation or gas prices or, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, the, I mean, the, 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 the things that were facing us as, I think, uh, as voters in this last go around were, you know, as high as they've ever been, the stakes were as high, and yet, I don't know how you explain this outcome more than the fact that people came to support democracy. Um, and so, it's the only explanation of why there wasn't just a tidal wave of red. It's the only one. You, I don't know how you can explain that every single election denier who was up for office particularly in the, uh, 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 you know, secretaries of state and the places that would actually impact 
the legitimacy of voting and, and, and the recognition of it, they all lost, every single one of them. Red state, blue state, purple state, didn't matter. I think voters said, wait a minute, this is a line we're not gonna cross here. I hope, I mean, that's my optimism so, about it. So quick prediction, two years from now? Joe Biden will be running against Donald Trump. Um, like, you laugh, but I'll, anybody wants to go outside, well, I'm laying bets on that right now. <laughs> It is, you know, there's that line, it is what it is. Um, and, uh, you know, Trump will announce tomorrow he will go out and do what he does incredibly effectively, which is he will annihilate every single competitor. Um, I, my bet is um, DeSantis doesn't actually enter the race. He'll play long ball here and understand that he can take the risk of going head to head with Trump now or wait and have a cakewalk in 2028. He's 44 years old. I know if I were advising him, I would just say go out and build your bona fides and support Republican candidates, all the things that he could do over these next four years to just put himself into a, you know, a certain uh, position for 2028. But so Trump will, you know, I think annihilate these people. He will, he will win for the, you just do the math on it. And the math is, is that um, you have 70% uh, of the 45% that is the Republican Party that are hardcore Donald Trump Magda, not beating it. There's, you cannot defeat that. There is no one, th that hardcore group of his, which, you know, he continues to just you know, fuel in a way, I think they're impregnable, and I don't think you can do it. And on the Biden side of it, um, unfortunately, the Democrats have done a miserable job of creating a next generation group of people. And, and whether you think, you know, uh, Grandpa Joe uh, uh, is the right one or not, he is the one who can and will be Donald Trump. He did it before. He will do it again. I will tell you, um, it has been uh, way over exaggerated, uh, uh, the issues around his clarity, his uh, uh, acuity, his um, uh, attention, his ability to command uh, facts and circumstances. I'm, I'm, I, I have spent time with him, and I'm telling you, he has his game together. Physically, he's 80 years old, and he does not move the way today that he did, which is be true of me when I'm 80 also, just to be really clear in this. But mentally, he is 100% on his game, and I believe he will run, and I believe he will actually um, uh, we'll have a, we'll, we'll have a repeat of what we had two years ago. Great. Well, we can go on forever. There's your mic drop. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you very much.